Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Mildly Interesting. Today, we're going to go through the Texas shooting, the North Korean missile taunt on the US, and the apparent monkeypox outbreak that is scaring everyone off. If you like all we do, follow us on all of our social media. We've got Instagram, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook. Follow our website. We post articles sometimes. Spotify, YouTube, whatever you want to listen to it. It'll be great. So without further ado, I'm Jean Sanz. And I'm Akash Lush. And this is Mildly Interesting. Mildly Interesting. No, seriously. Just smiley interesting. It's a little side note from this amazing episode. Thanks to the editing of the future. At the time of this recording, a lot of the information regarding police response to the text has been available. So some of the information might be a bit outdated. So if you do want more information on this issue, do check our website as there will be articles coming out on it. So yeah, just enjoy the show. So we start our podcast today with a... I, I suppose we, we should have a disclaimer for it. Uh, this is about the Texas shooting. So a lot of what we're talking about might be sensitive f- for some of you. So feel free to skip over if you don't want to listen about it. But on the 24th of May, uh, 19 children and two adults lost their lives when yet another school shooting at Rob Elementary School, and you heard that right, elementary, where children aged 7 to 10 are taught. The incident started as then 18-year-old Salvador Ramos shot his grandmother before driving to the school in Uvalde, Texas, where he crashed the truck he was driving, shot at passersby, and entered the school on foot, uninterrupted. The school then announced a lockdown due to the gunshots. Baramos barricaded himself inside a classroom, shooting students and teachers for a whole hour. Now, if you're thinking, how was he even able to stay inside the school for a whole hour? You're asking the right question. In fact, the police arrived on site four minutes after Ramos entered the school, claiming that they didn't go inside because of the gunfire they were receiving. Now, call me stupid, And I certainly don't have a police training, but in a country that already has 27 school shootings this year and 119 since 2018, you'd think that there are very well fleshed out methods sort of of approach to this, right? This isn't something new. And it's mind boggling to me how the police can be one hour outside while a gunman commits a massacre. There are even reports of parents being tackled to the ground while trying to enter the school to try and save their kids. This is crazy. Like, Akash, what do you make of the police approach, for starters? I mean, the police, law enforcement themselves have admitted that many wrong decisions were made that day. Uh, Stephen McCraw, the director and executive director of Texas Homeland Security, in a very... I think emotional and very contested media conference said that the senior officer on site did not enter the building because they delayed entering because they did not believe it was an active shooter situation. And he said that they waited for the school janitor to arrive with keys to be let into the school because they either thought there were no kids at risk or that no one was living anymore. Um, This description clashes heavily with the fact that uh, the gunman was like shot and killed at 12.51 p.m. And up until then, there had been multiple 911 calls from within the elementary school. It, to me, I just, it seems like a textbook case of desensitization. Like you said, this is... This is amongst hundreds of school shootings that have happened in America. And this is the 212th mass shooting just this year. There have been more mass shootings in America than days this year. So it just seems like it's carelessness. It just seems like carelessness from law enforcement where they believed that, you know, 
it, it just it, it boggles my mind that they believe that it was not an active shooter situation as calls were coming from the buildings it's just carelessness to the mo- to the highest degree but obviously we cannot just blame law enforcement here um one of the most contentious topics in america is that of gun reform or gun laws uh do you see anything changing from this hackers no I ju- I've genuinely given up on the idea that America will ever change or it, it will ever, you know, will ever implement gun control. This is one of the deadliest school shootings that have, have has happened in the history of America. Um, the a famous, uh, I hate using the word famous, but the most, I think one, if not the most, the worst school shooting was the Sandy Hook shooting where I believe 26 people were killed. Uh, that was in 2012. But in 2013, there was a bipartisan bill that would have required federal background checks for guns purchased at gun shows and on the internet. That's it. So after the deadliest school shooting in American history, um, there was a bill that had both Republican and Democrat support that was introduced that would just require background checks not even on all gun purchases, just those at gun shows and on the internet. Even that did not pass. It failed to pass in the Senate. And th- we found the same after the Parkland shooting. There was another, in 2019, there was another bipartisan effort to, to introduce background checks, but that stalled due to Democrats focusing on other sort of, um, I believe uh, their impeachment of Donald Trump is what took most of their resources and then last week, literally, last the the mass shooting last week where ten people were killed in a racially motivated hate crime in Buffalo, New York. Um, Democrats renewed their push for more robust background checks, but they were once again blocked in the Senate as the Senate wished for more calmer, less heart like less broad measures. It just boggles my mind that school shooting after school shooting. The government refuses to to introduce any kind of gun control. Just even just the most basic background check. Now, if you're also asking, how can a eight year old, eighteen year old buy two semi automatic rifles? You're once again asking the right questions. Gun laws in America, like Akash said, are borderline stupid. Now, if you want to hear us talk about gun reform more in depth, our opinions. Stay tuned because we're going to release a deep dive talking about just that fairly soon. But on a more general level, Akash, do you know anything about how gun law works in Texas? No, specifically in Texas, I am not sure. But I do believe that they have... Do Are, are they one with a concealed... Are they one of the states with a concealed carry law? Yeah, so for starters, as of 2021... You no longer need to have a license to have a handgun and to buy a handgun. Like you said, you can carry it out in the open for as long as it is in a quote-unquote holster. Now, why the quote? Because obviously, the law wouldn't define what a holster is. Not just that, but just as uh, as Ramos did, anyone over the age of 18, for as long as they aren't convicted of a felony or visibly on drugs, can buy a handgun. But you think, well... Maybe, since we're talking about the best, quote-unquote, best country in the world, uh, there would be at least extensive background checks to avoid school shootings, right? Well, wrong. Again, for one, Texas does not require private sellers to initiate background checks, only licensed ones. If you're buying a gun off of someone else, that someone else is not um, required to initiate a background check on you. And second, if you already have a permit, then you're just exempt from checks altogether if you want to get a handgun. So how about convicts? How about people with a history of violence? Well, same thing. As long as the state does not take your license away, you can still buy handguns without background checks. So even if you're talking about gun reform, and even if you're talking about the very extreme of gun abolishing, and these, uh, and this, my European mind cannot cope with this because I say extreme, but it's just normal for all of us over here. But in America, this is the extreme point: is gun abolishment altogether. 
even if you're just talking about reform, uh, just about extensive background checks, you're like Akash said, you still don't get anywhere. And once again, like you said, Akash, I also don't see anything happen in the near future. In fact, even after the Sandy Hook uh, massacre, even after all of the uh, mass shootings and school shootings, straight after those events, you always see gun purchases spike up because people are afraid that their Second Amendment right, or I should say their interpretation of their Second Amendment right, might be taken away, which will never happen, but they feel compelled to even buy more weapons. In fact, there are more weapons in America right now than there are people. So now we move on to our first segment of the week. Now, there's no good way of transitioning from our last topic, but this will be the conspiracy of the week. Uh, one of our favorite topics. And Akash, tell us about the conspiracy that you, you've brought for us today. Okay. Okay, are you ready for this conspiracy theory? Right? I am. Ooh. So, let me let me transport you to the Caribbean. Let me transport you to Haiti, right? Okay. Haiti, a country that I think most people know is is rocked by earthquakes because of its position over tectonic tectonic plates, right? Mhm. Wrong. Wrong. Okay. Because there's a conspiracy theory stating that the 2010 and 2012 earthquakes in Haiti were actually caused by a giant tunnel that the US is drilling under the Caribbean. Right. Okay. So this this American deep sea mining project is to unite the Caribbean islands with a single tunnel system. So the original article states that the Caribbean International Highway construction was featured on the Discovery Channel's Extreme Engineering documentary series, and is a project funded and organized by Caricom, a multinational uh, assemblage of Caribbean states. Right. So the idea is that you can get from Florida to Haiti to the north of Haiti in one in in one go, right? And okay. that future expansions would have you go from Florida to anywhere in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Cuba, the Bahamas, right? Okay. The Dominican Republic, right? However, there's one small issue with this conspiracy theory. And it is the fact that it is a conspiracy theory, and this does not exist, right? The project is completely fake. In fact, the article has a huge... The original article has a huge, bold, red text disclaimer on top of the page <laughs> saying, this is fake, this is, like, for fictional purposes only, right? Oh, no. The problem is, they didn't put that disclaimer there until a year after the article was initially posted. <laughs> So for a year, there was this article that no one knew was fictional, and most people just assumed it was real. Now, the Discovery Channel and Caricom, both of them did not get word that this conspiracy theory was going around, especially in Haiti. That, that's, the, that's the crucial part. A lot of Haitians <laughs> actually believe this as well. So, and what's worse is that the Discovery Channel has a whole website dedicated to the theoretical prospect of a Caribbean to America tunnel, right? It, do it doesn't say anywhere on the website that it's under construction, but sadly the website exists and that just confirms conspiracy theorists, you know, saying that this is a this is happening. But why? <laughs> well, I, I, no clue. We don't, we don't, we, we don't know. The, dis this, the Discovery Channel, I think... Uh, I I don't know why they discuss the theoretical prospect of a Caribbean tunnel. Um, maybe I think maybe it was like an old project during the when like the Monroe Doctrine was first introduced, where America was like getting protective over like the South American and Central American like countries. Maybe then they kind of discussed, but. Yeah, as as far as like why this conspiracy theory like was started 
or why the idea of a Florida to Haiti tunnel even came where it came from. No clue. No idea. Because if you, if you have a tunnel from like America to Europe, you like, ah, fair enough. That makes sense, right? If you, to Haiti, why? <laughs> why Haiti <laughs> of all places? Hey, don't don't disrespect Haiti. Haiti's got some banging 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 attractions. Like um, I'm I'm sure it does. I'm sure all the coconut trees are uh, are amazing to see. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, well, um, what what's your conspiracy theory for this week, Santos? Right, my conspiracy theory is not as lighthearted as yours, but it's also not as as long. Mine is pretty short. Uh, you might okay. have heard of this. It's the Great Replacement Theory. Do, okay. Do you know what the Great Replacement Theory uh, theory is? No. So essentially, and I'm really sorry to all of you far right conspiracy theorists that are listening to this. Uh, I'm sorry for calling this a conspiracy. Uh, you might okay. want to skip over this one. You are not going to like it. So it's essentially right. a far-right conspiracy theory spread by French author right. uh, Renaud Camus that says right. that through emigration and what he calls race mixing, non-white people are trying to replace white Europeans. That's okay. that's okay. it. That's just, okay. that's all. That's all it is. Okay. Uh, what <laughs> what I. Where do ah uh, what? Where do you even begin with this? It's like it's, you, it's one Illuminati like organization almost who are trying to get rid of white people. So wait, so like <laughs> just all just all non white people, just all of them, yeah, just, just collectively, exactly. So it's, especially Muslims. The, uh, the the French author specifies Muslims. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. I'm. I'm glad we have clarification. <laughs> but specific. So specific. Like, they've just all banded together and been like, "What if white people didn't exist?" Exactly. So the the idea is, whenever you see um, a white person with someone who's not white, like in a relationship, right? That's the great mm. replacement theory. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is. Okay, this is can't be. This can't. No, this can't be. A, what? Do you know what's was this guy smoking? You know what's worse about this? This is actually what? like it has been gaining traction in the past few months. Months especially. Why? <laughs> I don't know. It makes no sense. They're not. Listen, hey guys, <laughs> listen, hey. What? Okay, white people, white people, collectively, white. They're not trying to replace you. They really aren't. It's just like, <laughs> you know, we. It's what, 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 what. Like it's we're good. <laughs> it's, we're, it's okay. <laughs> we're we're happy being non-white. It's it's fine. <laughs> Moving on into more unknown territory we now focus on north korea and their ballistic missile program earlier this week the u.s intelligence community stated that they were trying to determine whether north korean ballistic missiles uh that they tested had properties that the u.s had not seen before so essentially that North Korea is developing weapons that the U.S. just didn't know about, which is, which, as I say it, is very concerning to everyone. Uh, North Korea's launch of three ballistic missiles on Wednesday included one that flew in a quote-unquote unusual trajectory. The missile had a flight path that two officials described as a double arc, so with the missile ascending and then descending twice. So... Obviously, when you fire a missile, it goes up and then it goes down and it hits something. Is there your expert as a assessment of our mi- missiles? That's my. Or that is. Yep. Yeah, this is. Hi. Yes. We. I am the <laughs> missile expert. I am the explosions expert for this podcast. So usually, when you fire a missile, it, it's a single arc. You it it f- goes up from the initial point of ejection, and then after a while, it kind of loses steam, and then starts pointing towards the earth because you know gravity 
However, this missile, and they didn't specify which three of the because mi- North Korea tested three, but this missile has apparently seemed to have the ability of kind of recorrecting its arc. So it would go up into the it would go up and then re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, but then go up once again. However, uh, <laughs> they did say in a statement that it's not yet fully clear to the US if that was all part of the planned flight path. <laughs> so this could this could be the development of a new style of targeting or it could be a missile that got out of hand. We are not sure. Uh, the missile tests followed US President Joe Biden's trip to the region where he announced his objective to try and denuclearize and demilitarize North Korea. So, why is why is this worrying Santos? Why is North Korea testing missiles? Why is that an issue? It was especially an issue because they did it hours after President Biden left South Korea. So this is just textbook provocation. Now, obviously, anyone um, testing missiles next to you is going to be an issue. But it's as much provocation as it is President Biden just going on a tour of Asia, talking to leaders of those countries. Because guess what? What he's probably trying to do is just to make sure they're not aligned with China or North Korea. So from the point of view of North Korea, this is just provocation answers provocation. And while in South Korea, President Biden did say that they were considering upping the military exercises and that he had plans, like you said, to deter North Korea's missile ventures. So it's just textbook provocation for both sides. Is anything going to happen off of this? Probably not. The US has already said that they're ready for anything that North Korea tries in relation to South Korea. So it's very, very unlikely that North Korea would just flat out blankly invade South Korea or try to do any major military moves. So it's it's essentially a spitting contact. See who can spit the furthest and it's just going to stay like that probably for a few years. The United States, Japan and South Korea have all come out and strongly condemned North Korea's recent ballistic missile launches. Nothing new there, right? But the US has moved to impose sanctions on those associated with Pyongyang's weapons program, and also has led efforts to tighten UN sanctions on North Korea after it carried out nearly two dozen missile launches this year. Also not a surprise, you can guess who opposed this US-led, uh, this US-led objective in the UN Security Council. Two members vetoed the move to impose sanctions, that was Russia and China. So, The U.S. sanctions targeted specifically supporters of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is North Korea's official title, uh, supporters of the DPRK's uh, weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs, as well as foreign financial institutions that have knowingly provided significant financial services to the DPRK government. Those included the Far Eastern Bank and Bank Sputnik, both Russian institutions for carrying out transactions for for North Korean organizations. Uh, The U.S. Treasury also sanctioned Jong Yong Nam, who is based in Belarus, for an organization connected with the already blacklisted North Korean Second Academy of Natural Sciences and Air Choreo Trading, which is said it was being used to supply the Ministry of Rocket Industry with electrical components and dual-use goods. So... It's, I mean, it seems like it's lines drawn that have long been drawn since the fall, since the defeat of Japan in World War II. It seems that North Korea is backed by Russia and China, and it seems South Korea is backed by the US, Japan, and other members of the United Nations. So what, like you said, is anything going to actually come about this? Because what we've seen is that there have been symbolic gestures, such as in 2018, the president of South Korea and Kim Jong-un coming to the DMZ zone and signing a proclamation for the reunification for steps 
to go towards the reuni- the peaceful reunification of Korea. But then we've seen North Korea show signs, according to South Korean intelligence, of doing underground testing on nuclear weapons once again. So what, I mean, do we think that this will end peacefully, more neg- like, it will it end at the negotiation table, or do we think it's going to be another stalemate of Russia and China vs the West, with Korea just kind of being a catalyst? Yeah, I think I think it'll be that last one that you just said. Uh, I think it'll just be essentially a whole Middle East um, situation again, where you've got um, certain countries that are backed by different countries, and they, those countries will remain in a state of conflict while those who back them will say, oh yeah, if anything more happens, then we'll do something about it. Because conflict relations between North and South Korea have been going on for decades. This is not a new thing. And they will continue to do so, it's just that no one's really going to do anything unless something, I suppose you could call it significant, happens. And like you said, I don't think uh, it's going to happen anytime soon. North Korea's ballistic missiles may have been a bad decision that provoked much of the international community. Much like these movies that we're about to propose that are so bad, they have provoked us into speaking about them. This is a new segment that I have made that I've brought to the table and I'm so excited for it. It's called Why Hollywood Why? Uh, Santos, what what movie are we, what what bad movie are we going to discuss today? Right, so I have a bit of an objection with you. I don't didn't necessarily choose a bad movie. I chose like a pretty decent movie. It just makes no absolutely no sense. So the mo- right. the movie I've chosen is Swiss Army Man. Have you watched that one? I've never heard of this movie. You have never wor- that that surprised me. You should watch it. Um, so it's essentially a movie about a man who got stranded on uh, on an island, and just when he was about to hang himself, he sees a body wash up on the shore played by our favorite wizard, Daniel Radcliffe. (gasps) Now, Hank, Hank, the main character, essentially becomes friends with this corpse. And throughout the movie, the corpse obviously, because of course it does, learns to speak English. Uh, I... There's just a lot of weird things in this movie, and it's really funny. For instance, like like, uh, Radcliffe igniting one of his own farts to kill a bear. That's something that happens in the movie. Uh, right, uh, okay. Radcliffe having an erection compass. Uh, uh, okay, wait, come again? <laughs> wait, he has a what now? He has an erection compass. So when he, get, when he gets an erection, his penis acts as a compass. Right, okay. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Es- okay. Essentially, Radcliffe becoming a fart-fueled speedboat. What is, what is this movie? What are you <laughs> I, don't, what? I don't know. Are you telling me Daniel Radcliffe? Uh, he listen, listen, this was this was this was Daniel Radcliffe going through his phase of trying out really stupid comedy movies. And Okay, uh, okay so it's it's a comedy. Okay. It it, it is I don't, a, I don't know why it, they didn't I don't know why it, they didn't click with me initially. But yeah, it's a com- <laughs> it's a comedy movie. It, it it's a it's a dark comedy. Uh it's a it's a really funny comedy. Uh, I I would watch it if I were you. It's really weird. At times, you're going to feel like you don't know what you're watching. And that's because you don't know what you're watching. Right. Okay. <laughs> that, it, that's crazy. Swiss Army, Swiss Army Man, everyone. How about you, Akash? What, what's the movie you, you brought for us today? My movie that I brought to the table is Rugrats in Paris. Now, have, <laughs> okay. have you seen this movie? I've, I've, I cannot say I have, no. I've, I watched this movie when I was a kid, and I've revisited it, because I, I, I only remembered bits and pieces, and I was like, huh, that movie was kind of weird. Is that real? Uh, turns out, it's weirder than I remembered it. So this is, this is pulled, these, these are pulled straight from the Wikipedia pages. Are you ready? So. Okay. At the wedding reception of Lou Pickles and his new wife, Lulu, which, great, great naming. Uh, a mother and child dance saddens Chucky Finster and his father, Chaz Finster, with memories of Chucky's mother, 
who died shortly after he was born. So already, Rugrats in Paris starts off emotional, right? Right. It, it, it's Chucky. It's Chucky looking at a mother-child dance and being like, "Man, I don't have a mom." So, <laughs> okay. does the movie then go with Chucky trying to find a mom? No. First, okay. first Tommy Pickles' father, Stu Pickles, is summoned to Euro Reptar Land. Uh, let me repeat that. He's summoned to Euro Reptar Land, a Japanese amusement park in Paris, to fix a malfunctioning reptar robot he built. So, middle of the night, someone calls Pick- uh, Tommy Pickles. Uh, sorry, Stu Pickles, the father. And they're like, hey, come to Paris. We need you to fix this robot. And then <laughs> Stu Pickles, it's like 1am in America or something. And then Stu is like, oh shit. Uh, okay, sure. I just accepted this job in Paris. Whatever am I going to do? I guess I need to bring my whole family and my friends and my friends' family and their dog. So the whole Rugrats <laughs> the whole Rugrats cast goes to Paris because Stu can't say no now. I don't know. And they go to Euro Reptar Land. Um, so then we're introduced to the movie's main villain. Her, she's a French woman. Can you guess her name? Oh, I I really don't want to sound racist here. Please please just tell me. Her name is Coco Labouche. <laughs> <laughs> and and she's talking she's talking to the president of the Reptar Corporation, uh Mr. Yamaguchi. And so Co- Coco Coco is the park's head. Remember Euro Reptar Land, right? Okay. And Coco wants to be the next president of the entire company. But Yamaguchi says no. His successor must love children. So she has to prove that she loves children. But, okay. But plot twist, she hates children. Right? What? Yeah. So but then <laughs> she conspires with Angelica, the 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 the, the slightly grown up rugrat that's like a bitch, right? She conspires with Angelica to to go marry Chaz. The guy who has a dead wife, Chucky's father, right? Okay. So, it, you you know where it goes from here. Like, Coco Labouche tries to romance him. Chucky is like, I don't like her. But then Chaz is like, I need a mother for my child. Whatever, okay? The movie goes on. <laughs> there's okay. there's like a subplot about the dog finding love with another street dog. It, whatever, that's that's all the sort of thing. Um, let me just read... Uh, <laughs> Let me just read uh, the the paragraph of how the movie reaches its climax. Are you ready for this? Uh, I am. Go on. So, on the day of the wedding, Coco Labouche has her accomplice. Guess what her accomplice's name is? That's right. It's Jean-Claude. Coco has her accomplice, Jean-Claude, kidnap the babies and Angelica to keep them from intervening. So Jean-Claude locks the babies in a warehouse. Like, okay, right? Real villain shit. But how mm-hmm. do the babies escape? That's right. The, the Chucky rallies the other babies to stop the wedding in the reptar robot. Uh, Jean-Claude follows piloting ro- reptar's nemesis, Robo Snail. And then they have a big Godzilla-like fight in the streets of Paris and the babies win. And that's that's the climax of the movie. I I will be honest with you, Akash. I have no idea what you just described to me. It's <laughs> a wild ride. I, there's so much I didn't even get into in this movie. The, the Rugrats in Paris lore is too like. There's so much. I think the most unconvincing thing is in the end, the the Rugrat the the parents adopt the stray poodle that their dog fell in love with. Who just who just adopts a street dog from Paris because your dog wanted to bang? Like I did. Th- what? Okay, okay, but if they adopt them, if they adopt a dog, are they now siblings? And that's where we end. Why Hollywood? Why <laughs> we're just gonna? Oh, <laughs> uh, don't. Now we move on to health. And in the 1980s, smallpox was eradicated in what some believe is the biggest achievement in the world of healthcare. Well, now, maybe his twice-removed cousin is coming for revenge. 
Uh, okay, Sen sensationalism aside, certain countries have declared a few cases of monkeypox, a rare disease that is transmitted mainly through mucous membranes such as your nose, mouth, and eyes, but it's not airborne like COVID. So usually it needs a prolonged face-to-face -face contact for it to spread, making it much less transmissible than COVID and not much more deadly than COVID because it has a 1% um, death rate. Now, transmissions with animals are also possible through scratches and bites, for instance. Now, Akash, should we start stocking up on pasta and canned food again? Uh, no. There has been a lot on the internet about sort of fear-mongering about monkeypox, that there's going to be another lockdown, there's going to be more quarantine, and no, for multiple reasons, because we are actually, believe it or not, we are a lot more prepared for monkeypox than we are for COVID. Um, as you have mentioned, monkeypox is transmissible by, like, physical contact, so it's not really transmissible, like, through air. Dr. Jennifer McQuinston, Deputy Director of the Division of High Consequence Pathogens and Pathology at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, long as title, but she did she did say that, you know, it, it it's not like COVID, where it's, it's not a situation where if you're passing by someone in the grocery store, you're going to be at risk for monkeypox. Unless you heavily snog that person, you're going to be fine. Um, we heavily recommend, at mildly interesting, that you do not snog strangers. Do not just kiss strangers, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Jennifer McQuinston also said that there are two strains of monkeypox and stated that the milder strain, known as the West African strain, is the one currently behind the global outbreak. So that probably should answer your question, should we panic? Not really, because it is... Uh, something else is that monkeypox is a cousin to smallpox. So antivirals typically used for smallpox has been shown to be effective in lab studies and in animal trials. And the smallpox vaccine has also been shown to reduce the risk of monkeypox after a person has been exposed. Data from Africa suggests one vaccine called Genios in all capital letters. I don't know if that makes a difference, but Genios is at least 85% effective in preventing monkeypox and if a breakthrough case does occur, may make the d disease less severe. And that was it for our episode of Mildly Interesting today. If you like what we do, make sure you press the like button, all the notification stuff, and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, on all of our socials, and on our website. We post, like we, like I said in the beginning, we do post articles every now and then that are very interesting. So, without further ado, I was John Sant. And I am Akash Lush. And this was Mildly Interesting. Mildly interesting. No, seriously, just smiley interesting.